So today I'm going to talk a bit like I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you are expecting to hear. So my intention is to talk a bit about DC networks, about the, their control, what makes them interesting, and what makes them maybe complicated to work with. Um, we're going to have a bit of a small introduction, maybe with some history and uh, some overview of what happened with the DC networks over the last century. Then, uh, since we're talking about hier hierarchical control, we're going to look at primary control and secondary control, and we'll look at different, I think, interesting things. Uh, some of the work that I present here is part of my PhD thesis that was uh, done in, uh, at the UPC in Barcelona, and some of the parts in the last part of the secondary control is more of my recent work, which is more oriented towards uh, smart grids, and we'll see some, some, I think, some interesting ideas there. So we'll cover like a lot of topics. I think like we'll look at different things. So don't hesitate to ask questions, either English or Spanish. I think I still have my Spanish good enough to understand the questions. Uh, but in the end, like I would like to, for you to have like a few take-home messages of what's in, interesting. So. If at the end of the presentation everybody understands what's the difference between AC and DC grids in terms of management and control, I'm happy. Uh, also, if we are able to identify what are the key parameters of like these systems and what what of these parameters affect the, the, their dynamics, should also be nice. How to play with these parameters, maybe to make a better controller. And in the end, we'll evaluate different ways of implementing the secondary control. And maybe we'll look at two different philosophies, I would say, of the centralized versus distributed uh, way of working. So start with some introduction. I guess this is like a big picture on a small slide. Uh, at the beginning of the time when there was no networks and no electricity, as I guess everybody knows, there were like two technologies that were fighting. It was uh, Edison and his uh, buddies that were advocating for DC technology, and then was Tesla and his supporters that were going for AC. So as we can, as we everybody knows, like when, if we look now, we are using AC, so Tesla won, and mainly they, because he was able to also boost the voltage and transmit this power to longer distances. But what happened is like DC didn't disappear, they didn't like completely vanish from the picture. So we see like from the 1800s when 1882, they were like first experiments using DC machines. Then they invented the mercury arc rectifiers and they were doing point to point transfer of power using DC. Then there was the thyristor like later in around the, I think the 50s, 60s. Uh, and they like with the thyristors, they made like some, a lot of really interesting projects the slides will be available, so maybe you will get to see some of those. Like, basically, transfer huge amounts of powers at very high voltages over like thousands of kilometers. So, thyristors were there, but the main problem with the thyristors is like it's very difficult to do multi-terminal networks. So, you had like just point to point. I think there were like some failed experiments where they tried to make three terminals or four terminals, but mainly it's like point to point, high voltage, high power uh, transfer. But then in, in the 90s, uh, this, the voltage source converter was developed based on transistors. And this revolutionized the whole hype around DC networks. So again, like, like this, now it's possible to make uh, DC networks with multiple terminals. And they are like a lot of advantages that we can get from the voltage source converters. And these are quite new, like just in the last 20 years, and they, they are developing fast. So some of the advantages, why, why DC? And we can find advantages at both the high voltage. And now a lot of people are looking at application also at the low voltage. So they can cover very large distances with small losses. Uh, there is no headache with the reactive power, which I guess nobody likes. And very, nobody understands. And nobody wants it there. So there is no reactive power. That's good. And you can, like until now, you, were, you can interconnect asynchronous grids, which is also nice. So if you have two AC grids, you don't have to worry about synchronizing them, just put a DC line between them. 
And moreover, with the voltage source converters, you have smaller filters, you can control reactive power, uh, sm small filters uh, make it very interesting for offshore wind power, for urban environments, so voltage source converters are quite nice. And as I said, multi-terminal configuration, you can have multiple points. So you have all these big projects now, like the North Sea project, where they have like all the wind resources of the North Sea to be introduced in the mainline grids with the multi-terminal DC network. You have this uh, European uh, high voltage grid that they were thinking. So a lot of interesting large scale projects. But also at the low voltage we have some interesting things like for example we have the DC microgrids. We have like batteries now, PV, electric vehicles. These are all DC technologies so it makes sense to connect them to a DC grid. And the most modern residential loads are also DC. So. Some people are also looking at DC distribution grids to replace the medium voltage AC with low voltage DC and there are some studies that show that maybe it's even economically feasible to do this now. So uh, because you can, you save money on the transformers, you don't need to uh, take down the voltage uh, so, and up the voltage so many times. So, uh, so there is a lot of hype now if you're looking in the literature around uh, DC networks. So a bit of how I got to the DC networks. I'm more from the power electronics side and mainly control and power electronic. And when I started my PhD, we were working with this system that uh, had a battery and a PV and was connected to the, to the grid. And uh, here, this is a multi-terminal DC network. You have three terminals connected to a common DC bus. So here you have already a DC network. And when you think a uh, um, modern, let's say, or a future residential system, you have an electric vehicle, maybe you have some PV panels on your roof, you have a battery for your electric vehicle, you want to maybe be connected for your grid, so you have a microgrid, a DC microgrid there. So when you think, like, how would I manage this system? How does this, all of these elements go together? It's like relatively easy if you look at the local thing. So yeah, here I would just put a central energy management system that maybe it's uh, implemented in the battery and takes care of the whole thing. So it's easy to manage locally. But then what happens when your system grows? Like your, your neighbor has also some PV panels and a battery and an electric vehicle and your system grows like a lot. How do you manage this system? It, it becomes a bit more complicated. So. The, I say, intuitive thing to do is to copy the AC grid. Like, these guys did a pretty good job for 100 years. Let's see how they did it. So, as everybody maybe knows, like, in the AC grid, they do it uh, in a hierarchical way. You have the primary control that's implemented locally at the generator level. It's fully decentralized, so you don't need any information from no, just local information that you have there. And its only objective is to keep the system running, to, to continue. Uh, regardless of what happens, keep the system working. Then you have the secondary control, which has like a global view and a global objective of an area. So it relies on communication. It's implemented in the current power system, implemented uh, uh, centralized. You have like a big control room somewhere that receives all the information from the generators and corrects the primary. So you have like primary takes some decision, the secondary control doesn't like it, and it corrects it. So you also have the tertiary control, which is like a long, it has longer time objectives, and usually, well, it runs offline, so this is not really, let's say, it's very interesting to look at, but not from the dynamics point of view. So, so this is how they do it in AC. And if you look at the DC, up until a point, we can draw like a very nice parallel between the two. You can have the same, like instead of having a big generator with a turbine and some valve controllers, whatever, you have a power converter, a voltage source converter. You have uh, some voltage, you do a droop feedback on the voltage, and you have an internal power controller. So you have like the same, you can have like a primary, a primary, and a secondary. So even if we look at the equations of the whole thing, you look at the swing equation in AC, you are able to draw a similar one, well, an identical one to on DC. The inertia in AC is given by the rotating mass of the machines 
in DC will be the capacitor, but like the equations match one to one. You look at the volt, uh, frequency voltage deviation based on the power imbalance. Again, the, the equations match one to one. So we say, okay, this is good. This will work. The problem is that uh, frequency is like in AC is a global parameter. Like you, you measure frequency in every point of your network, you'll get the same value. On the other side, DC a voltage on the DC is a local parameter, and it's influenced bo both by power flow, but also by power balance. So when you put current through a DC line or through a line you'll have a voltage imbalance. So this is like the power flow. But also if you don't have enough power in your system, also then the voltage will go down. So it's influenced by two aspects. On the other hand, in AC, frequency is influenced by power balanced. And the power flow, you have the angle. So you have two parameters that map into one parameter on the DC side. So this is a big difference. And another crucial important difference is the, ter the, the inertia. In AC systems, you have the inertia in range of 8 to 10 seconds, so like big rotating machines. In DC, since it's the capacitor that gives you here the inertia, these capacitors are quite small, so you have inertia in range of milliseconds, like at best. So expect here the DC system will be insanely fast compared with uh, this. So when something bad happens, it will happen very fast. So how we tackle this, well, how would, based on these aspects, how we decide to design the, the primary control, we, since your local, since your voltage is a local parameter, you'll have like a voltage profile of your whole network. So you have like a band and you say, okay, if all the voltages are in this band, my, my network is performing well. Then we define like some other additional bands for safety and from critical. You can see the same as the frequency curtailment reserves in AC and UFLS in AC. So more or less the same idea. The safety bands are for transients where a peak happens, something goes wrong. For a while you can be in the, in the safety bands. I think the batteries of this died. No? Okay. And the critical ones, when the voltages go into the critical band, then something is like seriously wrong and you should take some actions. So uh, based on these intervals, voltage intervals, we design like different droop characteristics. This is some that we thought of, but you can imagine your own. So you, there, there is like a bit of flexibility here of what you can do. For example, this one is like a bidirectional droop. Uh, it will be maybe in charge of an element that it's connected to an energy storage, so it can process energy. Uh, current, it can circulate in both ways, or maybe at the interconnection between two grids. So you can act as both a load and or, or a generator. And when the voltage is at nominal, you don't inject anything. So if voltage is nominal, that means the, the grid is OK. Uh, if we look a bit at energy storage, then you have to take into account also the state of the charge of the, um, of the energy storage. So what we said is, OK, like if uh, let's define some limits for the energy storage, how much can it can be charged or how much it can be discharged. And then when you approach these limits, start to move this shift, shift this characteristic up and down. And automatically, like this, you limit the current that you can either inject in the battery or uh, take from the battery. So instead of having just one droop characteristic, now you have like some droop surface that is designed, like that it's uh, defined by, uh, by the state of charge of the battery. So this is for energy storage. Uh, you can have like some other interesting uh, behaviors that you can obtain from this. Like for example, I called it a pseudo critical uh, element where you operate as a constant power source while you are in the normal operation and safety. But when things go critical, you start to participate in the voltage regulation. So this could be like some units that are under power supply contract. So normally you inject everything that, like your contract power, but if things go really bad, you deviate from this reference and then you correct. And you can have uh, also, like some smart heating or cooling units that can behave exactly like this, 
uh, and you have critical behavior, which is like this type of behavior will never, never change its behavior regardless of the voltage. So these are like the worst things that this, you don't want this in your network, but there are a lot of these things in your network actually. So this is some rough ideas of how we design the primary. And just to get some intuition, because it gets confusing, how, how would this work? I will show you like an example with these three nodes that we were playing at the beginning. So, so we have the three nodes. Current, negative current means current going into the DC grid, positive, it goes out. So I'm not sure if it's visible. Everybody can see it properly? OK. So we have the three, three nodes here. And at the beginning, here we have the AC, the power of the AC. So at the beginning, we have a zero power. So this one has a zero reference. So there is no power being taken out from the DC grid. So PV is controlled as a critical element. That means it injects maximum power. And the battery is responsible for regulating. Like the, uh, so what we see here is at the beginning is like the PV produces power, as they do, and the battery charges. It takes all this power and charges. Then at this first event, we enable the AC converter, and we set a reference of 100 kilowatt. And then what we see that starts to happen is a large drop in the DC voltage, so you have like a big drop, and this drop automatically uh, triggers the battery. The battery will start discharging to keep the voltage in the operating band. So here there is like a green interval, which is like the normal operating band. And the, the AC doesn't feel anything. He's a, criti a pseudo-critical, so while the voltage is in the normal operating band, he just injects what he, he receives. So, um, the battery starts to discharge, and the system works. Then, at the second event, uh, the battery reached this limit. We, we set 20% as the limit. So it reaches this first limit, and then what happens, as I was explaining earlier, it starts to shift the droop characteristic down. So what will, will happen is like the voltage will linearly start to, well, li with some bumps because of the PV production, but it will start to go down. So just to see what happens in the droop domain, uh, so we are here with the battery is here. We are operating at this point, and this is the point that maintains the system in equilibrium. If you shift your droop characteristic down, for the same voltage, you will automatically have a new operating point, which is of less current. So now your system is not in equilibrium anymore, but you have like a small unbalance. This small unbalance, in turn, discharges the capacitor. Some, th this energy has to come from somewhere, so it comes from the capacitor. So in turn, like your voltage will go down. So it will go down, and it finds again this point that brings the system in equilibrium. So this, like, like this, this will be like this ping pong behavior. You shift your droop characteristic down, the voltage discharges, and you find again the equilibrium point, while the voltage is slowly going down, and everybody knows that okay, the energy storage is like starting to be fully discharged. We should take some action. So this take some action happens when the DC voltage hits the critical band, and then the AC. AC unit says, OK, we're in the critical band. I should start to do something about it. And it starts to do something about it. It starts to participate in the voltage regulation. And it slowly reduces its, its power. The battery doesn't, uh, doesn't provide so, so much power. And it flattens out. And uh, here, like the DC, at some point, this will completely saturate. And you will inject in the grid everything from the PV, and the battery is out of the question. Again, in the droop domain, what happens? Now we are at the border of the critical limit. Uh, we have two operating points on the, on, the AC, on the AC converter, on the battery converter. These are like the equilibrium point. And then the battery shifts its droop characteristic down. They will, it will find a new operating point of a lower voltage. It will generate an unbalancement in your, in your system. It will discharge the capacitor, but now 
this new voltage will find two points, one on the, one on the battery uh, droop and one on the AC droop, because now also the AC is participating. So we see that before the, the battery would go back to this point here, that is the equilibrium point, now the AC uh, also the AC grid also helps. So this is just an intuition of how the system works, and uh, you can make it more complicated. This is just, but it starts to be like really difficult to follow. So this is just an example. But we tested with like multiple terminals. It works the same. It's really interesting to see when you have two batteries and one of the batteries saturates, and then when this one saturates, the other one picks up the slack of this one. So it like they they help each other. Like one battery, oh, I'm getting tired, then don't worry, I will pick up your, your work. So this is like just some intuition of how the system works, but it's interesting to see, OK, which are the parameters, how you design the system, how, you, how big should these bands be, how big should the safety bands be, who influences these bands, how, how, can, we, like, get, how can we design the system. So typically in a, in a power electronics converter, you have two control loops, an internal current loop and an external voltage loop. And uh, uh, this is uh, typically done so you can limit the current in term when you have a short circuit. So if there is a short circuit, you'll have the internal current controller that can saturate. So for our analysis, we'll, we'll assume that the internal current controller is well designed, like these guys that work in power electronics, they did a good job. So they designed a very good controller, and the only parameter that is of interest is how fast will this controller be. So how you give it a reference, how fast it will follow it. And then uh, the, the voltage controller is a droop controller, so the only thing that we are interested in is like the slope of this curve that I was showing. Is showing. So we have two parameters from the control side is the droop resistance and the time constant of the, uh, of the internal loop. And we have one physical parameter, which is like the capacitor of, uh, as I said, is the inertia of the system. So this is also important. So if we look at the dynamics of the system, is like this is our control loop. This is like a simplified model. What happens if I make a current step here? So as out of the sudden, I take current out of this system. So this is the response that we can get. They're like some straightforward uh, control system magic to do, but it's quite easy. You take the transfer functions of this system, and you obtain the response of both the current here. So we see the current response and also the voltage response. So what we see is like two important things to notice. First of all, the steady state deviation is given by the droop resistance. So this RD, this parameter here, influences your steady state deviation. The peak here, uh, so typically this, you would want, OK, all my steady state deviation, I want to have them included in the normal operating band. So I want to size this band, so all of this remain in the normal operating band. The peak here, the voltage peak, will influence the safety band. So you would want all the peaks that uh, appear during transients, you would want them to be in the safety band. So the steady state is quite easy. You can also play a bit with the equations and get an analytical formula also for this, uh, for this peak. And you'll see that they are all the parameters of your system that influence this, this peak. But now we have some analytical formulas and we can size our system, or at least this is what we think. Uh, because there is something that you cannot ignore, and that is the cable. Um, what we, what is typical is like you don't have the perturbation in your system here at the output of your source. It's typically after some cable. So you have your source, it's connected to a long cable to some load. That, that load creates your perturbation. So typically the, the step in the current will be here at the end of uh, a cable. So what we see if we do now the same analysis here, I have here we also have with the dotted line. The green dotted line is the one from before. And now the solid lines are from now. So when I make the step here, what we see is like we have more oscillation in the system, a huge peak compared to the previous one here at this terminal. So before we had this small one, now I have this one. And also more oscillation in the system. And moreover, the steady state 
is influenced by both the droop but also the parasitic resistance of the cable. So if we would want to size our system, we need to take this into consideration now. So what we noticed is that this peak, regardless of what you do with the controller here, you cannot really avoid it through control. So if we look here, we tested like different uh, droop values, so like uh, smaller or bigger like uh, slopes. And uh, we also compared it to like when you have here just a constant voltage source. So here an in a constant voltage source instead of your, of your converter. So the black line is the constant voltage source, so it's the most oscillatory. It has n no damping. But um, what we see here on the peak is that well, this, this doesn't help me. So yeah, on the peak is like very little influence uh, that you can improve this peak. You cannot really improve it through control. So this is like a physical parameter, uh, like the physical parameters influence this peak. So if, if there is like, if this peak is not influenced, what we can do then is consider the system connected to a voltage source here and have a simplified version of this and again get the transfer function and now we can get again an analytical formula for, for this peak here. So just like look, it's interesting uh, to have like this uh, curious approach about things. Let's see how the other parameters affect the, the, the system. So we saw that the droop resistance doesn't really help on the peak. And uh, the bigger the droop resistance, the better the damping in your system, which is good. Then we see, okay, what happens if I increase maybe like, okay, I cannot do anything to, through the droop, but maybe if I increase the capacitor here a lot, I can avoid this peak here. And we did this, I, we increased the capacitor here like two times, three times, four times. And we see that you really, you cannot really get rid of this peak. You have like better damping than, the, than in the constant voltage, but you cannot really get rid of this. What happens if I play, I make the controller, the internal controller, the current controller, I make the fastest current controller that I can do. Again, if you make it really, really fast, doesn't really help you a lot. If you make it really, really slow, you can make things worse. But uh, if you make it the best controller that you can do, it, it, it will only improve up until the limit. And then finally, if we see that only if you change the capacitor here, you can actually get rid of this peak. So like the conclusion is a bit obvious, but if it's like you need to have more inertia close to your loads. Like if you have like this, the load is here and it creates a bit perturbation, you want to have this capacitor here to hold a bit until, until your controllers can react. So you want more inertia here. So a big, a step back on the droop control, we saw that, okay, uh, big resistances, well, big droop resistances are nice because they provide good damping, but they are bad because they, I would point with my fingers. <laughs> so they are bad because they, they give you like a large overshoot, uh, oh, sorry, a large steady state error. So you have like a big droop resistance, big steady state small droop resistance, and not so good damping, but smaller steady state. So it will be like really, really nice if we can combine just the advantages of these two systems, like to have like a small droop that is a small resistance that is at the same time a big resistance. So I still needed to change the slides. So what we can do is like, um, you cannot do this obviously, but the trick is that you cannot do it at every frequency but you can target the frequencies that are creating your oscillations and create a dynamic droop in the frequency domain that takes care of this peak. So the oscillation is obviously given by the resonance of the cable with the capacitor, and it creates this peak that is approximately here. And what you can do, you say, okay, here in the, in the zero frequency, in the continuous steady state, I have my droop resistance. But here, where I have the peak, I want a bigger resistor. So I want this damping resistor. And you can do this. It's, it turns out it's just a lead lag controller. People in the control th systems, they do it a lot. And you can do the same also if you have a constant power controller that allows a bit of, uh, 
let's say, of uh, deviations, just to, they can participate in damping this system. So we see that if we put this controller in, so here we replaced the, here we don't have just a resistor, a normal resistor, now we have a dynamic transfer functions going on. And if we look at the response with this function, we see first thing we notice is the, like, the response in the current. Before we had, so I have again on the slides, I have also the initial, no cable, uh, cable with droop and this one. So before in the, when we had the droop, we had these oscillations. Now this overshoot in the current, which also can be dangerous, now we have this one. The, the, the time response is a bit delayed, so your system reacts a bit slower. But what this happens, avoids the oscillations and this comes at the cost that your voltage also at this terminal will drop. So instead of, instead of um, r being really aggressive with your control, you take a step back and you're a bit more laid back. And uh, the, the response is more like you take a hit and all the system goes down and recovers or before you take a hit and you oscillate. So this, this is the type of uh, uh, controller, it can do this. The, the parameter choice, the D, the damping that you choose will influence how much this current will be delayed and how much this voltage will go down. So if you choose this too big, it might be that you're making things worse. So it's a trade-off there. Uh, so just a study case, uh, five, I actually don't have the time. How are we doing on time? Ah, guess good. Uh, so a study case, uh, five, net, five uh, terminals, a DC network, and uh, this is how they res the system responds to a uh, trip. So the system is operating at some steady state and here the terminal number two disconnects. There is a problem and it disconnects. So this is how the system will respond with just the droop controller. We have like some oscillations. It will, like finally it stabilizes but it's quite oscillatory. People who work with the uh, stability of power systems will say that this is not very good because it can excite other modes. So, so you don't want this. With our controller, it responds like this. So the oscillations are damped faster. And again, like the peak, like the peak, you cannot get rid of it. Like the only way to get rid of it, increase the capacitor at that point. So we see here, like with all the fancy control that we were doing, you don't get rid of this. So this is just from the physical system. You need to change your design. So better damping that we can achieve. Um, I guess that was about primary control. I hope everybody is very confused by now. So we go and confuse everybody even more. And uh, we speak about secondary control. And now things start to be more mathematical. Until now they were quite engineering-ish. Now they become a bit more mathematical. Maybe this makes you happy, maybe this makes you sad. So. <laughs> so uh, since we're talking about secondary control, um, now we have to look at the system-wide view. So we have to introduce some matrices and some vectors. So power, the voltages, so the voltages in all the nodes of your network, the conductance matrix, which is the same as the admittance matrix, you know it from AC. So the a vector of the, all the droop uh, the coefficients in your system. And if you do this, uh, some small algebra, you can obtain an analytical formula of how your voltage will deviate in all your network for a certain deviation in power. So we know that there is some deviation in power, the voltages will be all over the place due to the action of the primary control. So. From the secondary control, you are left with the possibility of correcting this. So you can either change this input in your system, so you change the voltage references to, to change the position of your droops, or you can also 
add another input and act directly on the power input. So you can, either way, they, they have, they, you obtain the same effect, um, the same result. So the, for the secondary control, you need an objective. What will this secondary control do and how will he correct the primary? And for us, we choose the optimal power flow, but you can choose your own objective, like uh, maybe some security issues, maybe some economical objective functions. So for us, we, I, I wanted to play with the optimal power flow. So. So the problem with the optimal power flow in DC is that it's, as you can see from the uh, formulation, it's a quadratic problem, which is good. It's easy. The problem is that also the constraints are quadratic. So it's a cons quadratically constrained quadratic problem. And the bad thing comes from this matrix here, which is not positive semi-definite, which makes your problem NP-hard. And an MP hard problem is a hard problem. <laughs> so basically, there are no algorithms to solve this type of problems in an easy way, or at least for large scale, for large problems, so where you have like hundreds of nodes or thousands of nodes. So this is like a nasty problem to deal with. So we choose this one. <laughs> so before we go into this, um, a bit on control architecture, okay, so you decide on your objective, on the secondary control, on your objective, how do you want to implement it? So there are two point of views to philosophies that are now arguing in the literature. You can do it centralized, this is how they do it now in the power systems. So you have a bunch of uh, nodes doing their primary control, you gather all the measurements, you do all the calculations, and you send back new commands. So you have like a big central unit, a big computer does all the calculations, sends back commands. It's easy to implement, the algorithms are simple. Uh, this type of central units knows everything, what happens in all the systems, so it has a global overview of the system. But the problem is that such a system is not easy extendable, so every time you add a new node, you need to reconfigure your system. Uh, it's not computationally scalable. So if your system grows a lot, a lot, a lot, this central unit will not work. You'll need like a humongous computer. And you have also privacy issues. Maybe this guy doesn't want to share his data with this guy, so what then? And you also have a single point of failure. So if this goes down, everything goes down. Then in the middle, you have the decentralized. This is like the primary control. Everybody fully with its own business. You don't communicate with nobody, we don't, you don't care. So decentralized. And distributed is something in between decentralized and centralized is that you have intelligence, let's say intelligence, in every local unit. So every local unit is also in charge of the secondary control and it just communicates with its neighbors. So he decides, okay, I have a mesh of neighbors and with my neighbors I exchange messages and commands and together we coordinate to solve a problem. So this type of system is highly scalable. So you add a new node, it just needs to know its neighbors, and it starts from there. It's plug and play. You don't need, not everybody needs to know there is a new node. So it will be just him and his neighbors. But the problem is that the algorithms where you look at them, they are quite complicated when you try to solve problems in this way. And they are more demanding on the IC infrastructure, ICT infrastructure, so there will be more messages going around in your network, in your ICT network. So how do we implement the optimal power flow centralized first and then distributed second? So uh, this will be like the, let's say the global overview of the system. We have here an, a grid, a DC grid. It's uh, decentralized, it has its primary working. We designed it very good and we, implement a secondary layer, the centralized layer, which gets measurements from our grid and sends back commands and does all the calculations here. Since the problem was, as I said, NP-hard and there are no algorithms, it's not convex, so all these stories of people from optimization, there are some ways to deal with it. You can do some, basically you have to deal with the quadratics in the constraints, so you can do either a some Taylor relaxation, either a positive semi-definite relaxation, or you can put all your problem as a second order cone problem. So there are like three methods that I found. Or 
the method that I also like is like to not bother too much about this and give it to a nonlinear solver. So you have your problem, give it to a nonlinear solver that will deal with the actual problem and will give you a local optimum. So here, if you do this and you make the problem convex, you get the global optimum of a transformed problem. Here you get the local optimum, but sometimes a local optimum is good enough. So just a bit of this mathematical gymnastics that you need to go through. Uh, so you get the original problem, quadratic, uh, quadratic constraint. Uh, this matrix is not positive semi-definite, so bad. Uh, I don't go into Taylor. I suppose everybody knows like the how to linearize, but these are more a bit interesting. So what you do then is like you take these matrices that are not positive semi-definite, you decompose them, and you split them into two parts, like the positive part of the matrix and the negative part of the matrix, and you rewrite them like this. And uh, these two new matrices have the nice pro um, property that they will be positive semi-definite. So you, then you can rewrite the constraints. This doesn't really help. So you can rewrite the constraints like this, which is still not convex because here you have, uh, this will be concave. But then what you can do is you can linearize this. So you choose an operating point, and you linearize but just the negative part of your matrix. So if you do all these like four steps, you are with a new problem. And this new problem is convex, so you can use a convex solver. It will go very fast, and you obtain uh, the global solution of this. So this is for the, like, the positive semi-definite relaxation. You can put all your problem as a second order cone problem which again, they are like um, a few steps. So you transform your original problem into a new problem. So you introduce now a matrix variable, W, where on the diagonal you have the square of your initial variable, and on the non-diagonal terms you have products, cross products of the ij terms. And then when you rewrite the problem like this, you obtain this uh, inequality, which is like the second order cone trademark, let's say. And then this, again, can be solved with a second order cone solver. You'll get the global optimum. It's easy to solve. No problems there. And you can get your solution back from, from, uh, from, the, from the solution of the transformed problem, which is, is important, because in some cases, you cannot. So we have all this methods, and it's interesting to see, okay, how do they compare to the nonlinear solver? So the the nonlinear solver is the one that doesn't give you any headaches. So you take the original problem, you plug it in, and it gives you some solution. So uh, here we have in relative errors, uh, the Taylor approximation, the positive semi-definite, and the second order cone, uh, it's relative error to the nonlinear solver. So see we, here, and we, we looked at two things. First, the objective, like, OK, how, how much better is the solution of one solver compared to the other? And uh, at the constraints. So when you linearize the constraint, you're not really operating on the original constraint. So you'll get the solution that is not really maybe feasible. So the nonlinear will give you a feasible solution, but these other ones will not. So what we can see here, for example, the Taylor approximation uh, gives like a better, a better like with 0.4 percent. We tested, I think, 2,000 different scenarios for uh, 27 terminal networks to get this. So, in average, you get like I don't know 0.41 percent better objective, like a better um, result better objective function result, but at the cost of uh, violating the equality constraints with around between minus 1 and 3%, which might be not so good. On the positive, positive semi-definite, you almost don't violate at all the equality constraints, so quite nice. Uh, but the objective function is a bit worse than in the case of the nonlinear solver. And finally, in the second order cone, this is the, the best one. Uh, you get almost zero violation of the constraints. And the objective function is slightly better, like 0.01%. So then 
if there is an option to take the problem and solve it in an original form, or you have to make like all these crazy things to get something that is 0.01% better, I'm not sure like if it's always worth it. So for our cases, we didn't bother. We used a nonlinear solver. So some example, um, we have again the five terminal networks that had the primary going. And now we implemented the secondary on top of it. So what we see here is uh, now it's important to look at the time scale. Before, we were looking in milliseconds, so everything was happening very fast. Now we're looking in seconds, so the action of the secondary is much slower. So here at the beginning, again, we set uh, some references to the different, um, to the different uh, loads in our system. And then we see here the secondary control starts to act. It raises the voltage in the networks because higher voltages will automatically imply um, lower losses. But it also, it's interesting to see here is like the, the power references, they, 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 they change. So what the secondary control sees is like, oh, I'm consuming power here and here. Maybe it's better to provide it from here because I'm closer. So this is something that the secondary control can see, but you at the primary control cannot. So here we see like the Terminal three increases uh, decreases increases its power, and this one wait may I said it the other way yeah P four is uh, here, so P four increases its power and P two decreases its power so to to uh, minimize the losses in the network. Uh, another case okay what happens when you have a trip in your network one of the nodes disconnects uh, again we have the peak that we can only reduce with the capacitor. And uh, um, what we see is like the, oh, I didn't show the losses. The losses are going down here. So these are the losses here. So we have like voltages, power, and losses. And we see that the primary control, we say, OK, my, with my reference point, the losses will be here. And then the secondary, through its action, reduces the losses. So good job. Um, here is when one of the terminal trips. So we have the terminal three has a trip. And then again, uh, there is no more power being consumed here. It's just power being consumed here. So we can provide this from only from the fourth, from only from the terminal here. There is only one line here. So it makes sense to provide it also from here. And the secondary control finds this, uh, this case. Uh, this other two terminals go towards 0. And this one increases its power to supply this one. So that was the secondary control implemented centralized. Now we look at it at the distributed case. So before, we had the layer of like the secondary control on top. Now we have everything happens inside the grid. And we have new communication links. So we assume that everybody is talking with its neighbor. So if we are electrically connected, we can exchange messages. So before we go and show how we can solve this, there is like this class of problems that are called general consensus problems, where you have local objectives. And you have a network. And you have each node has its own local objective. And then the local variables are just, let's say, Copies, but copies is not a good word. They are like, they reflect the same global variable. So we have a variable that we need to agree on. So when we solve our local problem, it's not that we just solve it. At the end, the variable that we share, let's say, needs to be the same. So that's why it's called consensus. So. Everybody has its own local problem. And through the algorithm, you optimize the sum of everybody. So how you solve this? There is a nice algorithm that is called the alternating direction of multiplier method. And uh, this one solves this type of problems. And it has three steps that you do iteratively. So you have an iterative process going. And um, uh, there are three steps. First. You need to rewrite your problem as an uh, augmented Lagrangian. So you have some prices that you need to add. 
and you have like your step size. And the first step is everybody solves its local problem. So we are in the network, I solve my problem, you solve your problem, everybody solves his problem. So this is the first step. This happens decentralized. I don't need no information, I just, from my local view. Then the next step is we need to update our opinion on the global variable. So we need, I know that we share like a global variable, we need to agree on this. So then you do like this other step, which looks like mathematically complicated, but in fact it's just we need to average this value. So from my local calculation, I create like this beta variable, and then you have, we have like you, me and you, or the people who are sharing the same beta value need to average this value. So this happens here. And this you can do just by exchanging messages with the neighbors that share the same component in this beta vector. So this is the step that happens distributed. And then the third step, we need to update the prices, like the Lagrange multipliers of, uh, of, uh, of, our, um, of our algorithm. So this again happens decentralized. So you don't need no information. So there is like three steps. Decentralized, distributed, decentralized. So this algorithm can be implemented in a decentralized fashion. Distributed fashion, sorry. So just how can we put the DC optimal power flow in this uh, general consensus form? Well, it's a nice observation is that we can split the, the load of the burden of the power flow. It's like if I'm a node in a network, I will only optimize half, like the losses on half of each of the cables that are connected to me. So if I have three cables, I will cut them in half and I will optimize only these three halves. So it's local information. I know the cables that are connected to me, I know my voltage, and I know the voltages of my neighbor. So each local, each local node keeps a vector of its own voltage and the voltages of its neighbors. So this will have four, so it's, I guess it's quite clear maybe. So uh, if you put a problem like this, if everybody optimizes half of the cables, in the end when you put them together, you'll optimize all the losses. So the thing is that now for the same voltage V1, which is like our global parameter of our system, you'll have several copies of this V1. Node one will keep one, node two will keep one, node four and node three, because they are all neighbors with V1, so they keep the, his voltage. So our algorithm needs to solve this, but in the end, this needs to be the same. They need to agree, they all need to have the same value. So, and you do this through like transposing ADMM, which is like looks mathematically complicated, you put it in like this algorithm-like fashion and you implement it in some programming language of your liking. And uh, you have this uh, iterative steps where you start with some initial guess on the global variable Z. So you don't know what they are, but you say make okay, some value, you start with zero. You start with some guess on the Lagrange multiplier on the prices. And then everybody does like these three steps. Solve locally, exchange message with the neighbors, update your assumption on the variables and again and again and again. So you do this, we, and we tested it. Since we are distributed systems, are more interested in, in like n networks with more nodes, so we took a bigger network. So now here in this network we have six generators, so the green, the green droop curves, and the rest are loads. And each of these converters of these nodes in the network are implement, implement this algorithm. And everybody does the same in parallel. So here is what we see, the, the design parameter, like the only design parameter that you need to worry about is like this rho, which is like the step size, how much you take your step in one direction or another. Uh, and here we see our, the convergence of our algorithm for different step sizes, so, so for different row values. The yellow background are the generators, and uh, the others are the loads. Here we have the losses, and I'm not sure if it's visible on each of these plots, we have like a black constant line. This is the solution that the central controller will give you. So I think it's visible here. 
So here, this is the solution that the central controller will give you. And we see that for every step, step size, after, as the, here we are in the iteration, so the horizontal axis are iterations. So as the iterations go, everybody converges to the same solution as the central controller. So we are able to implement distributed, so the, the same, we have the same results as the centralized solution. And this, what, so we need like ADMM, like people will, if you look in literature, everybody complains that it's slow, and it's indeed slow. It takes like 250 iterations to solve this problem. If you take a second order cone or like some other method on a centralized computer, maybe you'll need 20 iterations. So it's like insanely fast when you do it centralized. However, this is like when we start, I say with a cold start. I have no idea on the state of the system. I have no idea on the Lagrange multiplier. I have no ideas on the global variable. Typically, you run in some tracking mode like this will be just when you start up the system. But if you run in some tracking mode, like we do here, so we, we were in some steady state, I create some perturbations, we see that we need maybe around 150 iterations because now I start with some assumption, which is not completely idiotic, of the global variables and on the Lagrange multipliers. So here you need like, again, we have two cases when we make like 15% random changes in all the loads and when we make 30% random changes in all the loads. And uh, we see that, yeah, everybody converges again to the same solution as the, as the central controller. The losses go to the same value. So again, we obtain the same solution, decentralized, distributed, sorry, sorry. distributed as we did the centralized. So, but then again, we are still in the iteration domain, so this doesn't tell us much. How much is like 150 iteration or 300 iteration? Is like a minute, a second, two hours? Like difficult to know. And I did something. Oh, ah, here. Next one. So to test this, we had to. There are no system like uh, if you look on. At, as far as I know, there are no systems to test this type of problems because it's a mixed simulation problem or like a mixed design. You have on one side, you have the physical system, but you also need the ICT infrastructure, so the telecommunication part, and you also need the distributed computation part. So you have a system that has like three different types of modules that need to be plugged in together. So we are, we're de are developing for the last six months, eight months, something like that. We are putting together the setup to test where we have the Opal RT, which maybe some of you know, it's like a big, big computer. It's a real-time simulator. You give it like a big model of a physical system and it runs it in real time. So it's like a, a supercomputer, basically. And in this supercomputer, we added another process in parallel with it that gives access to external devices to get measurements from this. So like this, we can have a distributed small controllers. We are using this Raspberry Pi, which probably some of you know is like the small one chip, one board computer. So all of these are our nodes, our agents in the system. So we, here we have like also complete control on the telecommunication part, so you can play with it. You say, okay, let's see how this behaves when I have some losses in the telecommunication part, when I have some delays when maybe some of the communication lines fail, and so you can test like different things. So we implemented our algorithm on this system, and at the moment, so this is something that I finished maybe the last week. So we are working, we implemented everything in Python, and some of the performances that we are getting out of the system at the moment, but I, they, they can be improved. Uh, we get like, 2.5 to 3 milliseconds to get a measurement from Opal RT to the agent. Uh, the local optimization takes around 15 and 40 milliseconds depending on how many lines you have connected. So if you are a node that has a lot of lines connected to you, it will take a bit more to solve the optimization problem. We, we are using, as I said, a nonlinear solver. Um, and then when you do the coordination between the agents, it's like depending on how you do it. If we do it on a wired connection, so with cables, TCP, IP, uh, we get like between uh, 10 and 20 milliseconds for passing a message from one agent to the other. 
which in turn adds to 60 seconds to perform 300 steps of this algorithm. So in less than one minute, you perform 300 steps. And if we coordinate over wireless, we get around 60 to 70 milliseconds of delay when passing a message to, to, from one agent to another. This is like performance that you would get maybe in a 4G network. So if you're thinking, okay, like some, something like this, like a good 4G network will give you something like this. And it takes a little under three minutes to, to do this 300 steps. So it's still not really like impressive even though if you think about it, like you have a system that can reconfigure itself every minute, I think it's good. But like the really, really key point is that these time frames you can expect regardless of the size of your network. So if you have, in theory, infinite agents, they will have the same time. Because the moment you add a new agent, it will be parallel computation power that you add to your system. And he performs his algorithm in parallel with the rest. So if I have five nodes that are doing this algorithm, where I have a thousand nodes that are doing this algorithm in parallel, they will converge more or less like in the same time frame. So like the advantage of such a system is like really, really, really large systems so with a lot of nodes that, uh, that the central controller will not scale nicely with such a system. So I don't know, are we going, going down on time? I, I've been like blabbering. So, um, going on the summary, so my hope was like to mm, be able to like maybe point out some of the differences between the AC and DC grids. And here, like I was saying about like keep in mind that frequency on the DC si on the AC side is global, the voltage on the DC side is local, and the inertia, this is like critical, like the inertia in the two systems are, is highly different. So uh, I think you cannot have it any other way than to have a decentralized primary in a DC network. If somebody makes a control of a DC network and he has like a big loop with delays in it and so on, I'm skeptical. So I think you need hierarchical control for it and the primary needs to be decentralized. So to, to deal with this fast dynamics. So hopefully we were able to look at some uh, of the parameters that affect the dynamics of the system. And uh, remember that the cable cannot be ignored. You need the cable. It will influence the voltage peaks. It will influence the steady state. Uh, the droop resistance is nice. We can play with it. Uh, a high droop resistance, good oscillation damping, but uh, large uh, steady state. A low droop resistance is like bad oscillation damping, but small uh, steady state deviation. But we can combine the both in a dynamic group. Uh, the time constant of the current loop, it's good to be fast, but if it's like insanely fast, it will not help you get rid of the voltage peak. So for sure, you cannot make it incredibly slow, like take 10 seconds to have the current re response, but like, it's only so much that it can do. Uh, and uh, to get rid of like some of these voltage peaks, you might need to increase, like to change the physical system. Uh, on the secondary control, we show, well, hopefully we looked and we saw that uh, the optimal power flow is the kind of a hard problem, but there are different ways to deal with it depending on your liking, on the size of the problem, on the devices that if you want to do like real-time embedded solutions. And so depending on your application, you have different ways of looking at this. You have nonlinear solvers, which will give you a local optimum, but will not give you too much headaches. And there are different architecture for implementing the secondary control. You have the centralized. It's simple to implement. Uh, you have the global overview of the system. But you cannot extend it so easily. You have privacy issues, single point of failure, all this. You have distributed, and I put two check marks because it's like very important. It's highly scalable, so you can have a lot of nodes. Think of like the modern, because this is like a lot of uh, topics from the smart grids that are coming into this area. I don't know. Imagine like every electric vehicle communicates with every electric vehicle, and then by themselves decide on how they should charge or like. 
every building in a city starts to become a more or less self-sufficient from the energy point of view building and then it communicates with their neighbor and they have their own energy trading going on and they try to optimize things. So like think like application like with a lot of nodes, like with a lot of agents. So highly scalable, plug and play. Add a new node, tell him its neighbors, he will take it from there. But complicated algorithms, uh, slow convergence, you need the ICT which is important and you will see like a lot of people working now on the internet of things and so on that is also coming into the into the power system and for us for the power system guys at the moment we don't have the tools to properly test this system you will look at the literature you read the papers and people are like i don't know two three nodes and they call it like a distributed uh, system and because we don't have the tools at the moment there are no commercially available tool that okay i can build my system and test exhaustively like these ideas so yeah some further reading like this is just some papers that i would like while i was reading these are some papers that i liked a lot so if you want to know more about the droop control of DC grids, I recommend the work of um, this group from Norway. If you want to know more about distributed optimization and ADMM, more than I will ever be able to explain, like read the work of uh, Stephen Boyd, like he's an endless resource of, of uh, optimization ideas. Uh, if you want to know more about distributed systems, uh, uh, there is the, this uh, young researcher at, um, at the control uh, and automation laboratory in Zurich. Uh, check out his website. Check out his master course. You can find it online. He speaks like a lot of interesting things about distributed system, about consensus problems, and so on. So definitely check this guy out. And if you want to know more about everything that I'm speaking, read some of my work as well. So, uh, Yeah, that's about it. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Questions, like any type of questions. <laughs> yeah, tell me. At the beginning of the presentation, you yeah. mentioned the distribution. distribution sorry. So my question is, is it uh, uh, in economical terms, terms is it uh, reliable to implement DC at distribution? Yeah. There, uh, I didn't make the studies, but there are some papers from a Finnish, uh, a Finnish distribution company, and they were making uh, some uh, feasibility studies of uh, DC networks on their, uh, on their networks, and they came up that it's uh, financially feasible to replace, I think, like 30% of their medium voltage AC with low voltage AC. So I can find the paper if you're interested and send you. So uh, it might be. I guess it depends on the structure of your networks and all that, maybe more in rural areas than in urban areas. I'm not sure, actually. But I can pass you that paper. But apparently, there are some people that say it's feasible. And for sure, I think it will also be feasible like in the things to come. Like thing, like now the electric vehicles are coming. It's like uh, uh, they will force the distribution system operators to upgrade their system, and uh, maybe now is the good moment to change at least part of them. Like I think, like the electric vehicle will perturb a lot of this uh, well-established transmission to distribution to so. so. Well, I've been working. <laughs> I've been working for like uh, I don't know a few years on DC, and uh, I, I I like the perturbation. What I don't like about the AC, like uh, I'm also like with some background in IT and computers and so on. Think about the internet. Is the internet designed in the same way as the AC grid? It's still like a massive network but you don't have like this big transmission companies, big distribution companies that have like their monopoly on the whole thing. And if you want to like, the, the, the grid cannot evolve in the same way as the network. If you want to make your own distribution company and have like a small neighborhood that connects to another neighborhood, you will not be able to do this because of the way it's now. So I think like this hierarchy 
Should I turn off my microphone when I'm saying all of this? Or <laughs> so so I, I, I think like this hierarchy should like be a little bit bent in like some of uh, like very idealistic views that I've seen like to have local uh, uh, microgrids that are synchronized, not in the microgrid until like some years ago was like this have a microgrid to be islanded from the grid you're on with your own business, but to have like own uh, like microgrids that are synchronized and that they are maybe interlinked with DC links, this would be interesting. But I don't know, there are like some, but to answer your question, like from the operational point of view, I like the DC because I like power electronics and you have like, it's faster and you have more control than like big generators and so on. So you can implement locally, it can grow locally. Like you put PV on your house, you buy an electric car, you buy a battery. So it can grow from the ground up and not from the big generators of reactive you know, uh, nuclear power plants and so on. So yeah, I, I like it because I think it can grow from the ground up. So that's why I like the DC. I don't know if it answered your question or I'm going on a tangent here. Yeah, don't make sure. How do you think that you can improve the DC network? Sorry? How do you think that you can improve the DC network? I improve it? Yeah. <coughs> A problem, well, depends on what type of problems you, so the DC network is not something that I think that now can be out in the market or like a feasible. There is the problem of uh, protection, which is quite uh, shady now in the DC. So it's a new, you, you don't have the advantage of crossing zero so you can cut the current. But I think what's also missing, but it's also missing in AC to have devices to be able to control like the power flow. So it will be like, ideally, if we want to manage the electrical network as we manage the internet, it should be able like, when I put power in the grid, I should, if I would be able, if I could control which way this power goes. So I, instead of, I put it the power and the, the, the network decides how the power is flowing because of its physical properties. If I would be able to do, I put the power and I decide go on this line or go on this line or go on this line. So I don't know if like some crazy power electronics, Things that that would be really nice to have in AC and DC, I guess. Like, so, and uh, also the problem with the inertia. If you could make like, if you if you if it would be safe and commercially feasible to put like these big 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 capacitors or these big batteries in the middle of your network to have like a slower inertia, that would also be good. So, yeah, I think these are like from. I don't know if I can think of something else. No. Or any other storage things? Yeah, yes, the stor storage is good. Like we, uh, yeah, some sto storage will, you can have like the same way they have in AC inertia emulation. Maybe you can have in DC some sort of inertia emulation based on some big batteries or things like this. So we'll have distributed storage and manage it as, as virtual inertia. And so. Yeah, maybe there. As you have already mentioned, I think that the DC protection is an uh, important topic. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about uh, the possibility of changing the, the voltage level on the DC network? I think that maybe a key component is also DC DC converters, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I'm getting where you're hinting at, but uh, re please repeat. So yeah. as I see, so if, see if I yeah. 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 Well, uh, everything that is like DC and it's uh, like primary source, let's say, you have a battery or you have like PV or these will be interconnected to some DC-DC converters to, to, to your grid. 
Then if you have two grids of different voltages that you want to link together, there will be again a DC-DC converter. But the DC, DC, this is not, I don't think the power electronics of DC-DC converter will be any challenge. I mean, even at high voltage, now they are looking at these voltage source converters. You have like this multi-modular things and so on that you can link with AC and also with DC. So I, I don't think the problem is like, like here maybe, but maybe I'm missing something. But uh, what will a problem which is like everything that is power electronics based, and I know there is a group of uh, Fred de Blabjerk in Denmark that they are looking a lot at this, is like the reliability of power electronics. Like if you have a transformer, you put it there and you have it for like 70 years or like since the beginning of time, it was, it's growing there. It has plants growing on it, so it's still working. And uh, power electronics is like electronics. Uh, they are not so reliable. I'm not sure exactly of this, their state of their research, but when they were, last, uh, last presentation that I saw was for wind turbines. And in, in a wind turbine, the components that fail the most are the power electronics. So if we decide to build a grid based only on power electronics, maybe we should like think twice. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's like... Uh, Actually, I have no idea, like in terms of cost, how much it costs a, a big power converter compared with like a big transformer. I know they are not cheap, also the big transformers. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like a, yeah. So, yeah. That's the problem that uh, you the developing of the DC grid has to be paid. Yeah, yeah, but but this. But this is like a problem that we get into. It's like this, that me as an engineer, I really don't like it, like the business models. It's like, of course, if like the distribution system operator needs to pay for it, he will not pay for it. He has his own business model. It's working. He's getting his money. He has like a lot of clients. He will not pay for it. But if some, I don't know, some brilliant young guys, they come with an idea, make a business, maybe it will work. Like. Uh, depending on how you put the problem. But it's above my, my level of understanding of the world. So this with business and economics and <laughs> so. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you.